Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to Lecture 28 in our course on General Psychology. Uh, and in this lecture, we'll continue our unit on psychological disorders, uh, and we'll continue also with the vein of describing examples of psychological disorders. Uh, as I mentioned last time, there are too many to get into all of them, uh, but we can get into some of the most common and most devastating. Uh, so here, uh, I'll talk about uh, schizophrenia, mood disorders, neurodevelopmental disorders, like autism spectrum disorder. Uh, I'll talk about personality disorders. Uh, and then at the very end, I'll talk about self-harm behavior. So we're going to continue learning about different disorders. And of course, these disorders uh, have different diagnostic criteria. They have different symptoms. Uh, so mood disorders include uh, things like depression, bipolar disorder, which you've probably heard of. Uh, and so they're grouped together into mood disorders because mood uh, is, is the primary symptom. That's what's disturbed uh, in depression and bipolar disorder. Uh, schizophrenia uh, also has multiple symptoms, and it's another one of these disorders uh, where a person is diagnosed based on some subset of those disorders. So you can have two people with schizophrenia uh, that exhibit different symptoms. Uh, and so that's another common theme of psychological disorders is the variability in symptoms. Uh, again, I'll, I'll look at neurodevelopmental and personality disorders. Uh, the first of those, by definition, occurs during childhood. Uh, and the second, as we'll see, uh, are disorders of personality. They, they are uh, often not as obvious uh, as other disorders are. Uh, and there's a question as to exactly if all of them should be qualified as disorders, uh, or whether they just represent extremes on the existing spectrum of personality traits. So we'll talk about that as well. Uh, in particular, uh, we're going to look at symptoms and diagnostic criteria uh, for all of these things. Uh, and we'll see why some of these have difficulties in diagnosis, why uh, some of them may be separate disorders, maybe why we question uh, the grouping of disorders. Uh, we'll talk about risk factors. So there are certainly biological risk factors for these disorders. Uh, there are also environmental risk factors for these disorders. And we talked about that last time, how the role of genetics in particular, but biology in general, uh, and environment, why those things interact to produce mental disorders or not. Uh, we'll also see that as before, uh, these disorders are, are pretty common, uh, especially since so many of them are temporary, uh, and a person may exhibit them at one point in their life and then not again. Uh, last time I mentioned that uh, around half of Americans uh, exhibit one mental disorder or another at some point in their lives. So they are more common than the average person expects. Uh, and as always, we will relate these phenomena uh, and their psychological processes uh, to the brain. So what do we know about the relationship between these disorders uh, and the brain? So we'll talk about that as well. Uh, so I'll start by talking about depression, uh, which is technically known as major depressive disorder and sometimes called unipolar depression. Uh, that's in contrast to bipolar disorder, we'll talk about it in a minute. Uh, but depression is fairly common uh, and the symptoms involve a loss of pleasure. Uh, so it's often called anhedonia. Uh, so the person can't, doesn't feel good. Uh, things that used to make them happy or used to be pleasurable aren't anymore. Uh, the person often has feelings of worthlessness, uh, of helplessness. They can't do anything about their situation. Uh, they also exhibit uh, low energy many times. Uh, and their sleep behavior is disturbed. And this could go either way. The person could either sleep to an abnormal degree, that is, they sleep a lot, uh, or they have trouble sleeping. They can't sleep. Uh, so either of those can occur. So that's why I use the general term sleep disturbance here. Uh, and again, we have this idea of persistence, uh, that these symptoms have to last for two or more weeks. Uh, so a single night of sleeplessness doesn't count. Uh, a low energy day, uh, there's something doesn't doesn't feel good that normally does. Something doesn't make you happy that normally does. Uh, just one instance doesn't doesn't do it. Uh, but if it lasts for a couple of weeks or more, uh, 
uh, then that starts to qualify for depression. Uh, and there are internal psychological processes that inform uh, the diagnosis of depression as well. And this feeds into what's known as helplessness theory. Uh, the idea that those with a depression are uh, often predisposed uh, toward treating negative events uh, as being internal, that is their own fault, uh, as being something that, aren't, that isn't going to change. Uh, it's permanent. And also it's general. So it's descriptive of their lives or their personalities uh, and, and at large. Uh, and so the idea that they can't help themselves out of their situation, and therefore they give up. Uh, so that, that, that is one of the uh, frameworks by which depression is described, the idea of helplessness. Uh, in terms of prevalence, depression is one of the most common psychological disorders. It has a lifetime incidence of around 18%, uh, which means that 18% of people uh, report having depression at one point or another in their lifetime. So it's a, it's a lot of people. It's a, it's a very frequent disorder. Now, there are sex differences. So it is more common uh, among women than among men. Uh, one thing to note there, though, is, is that we don't know whether that, that is a biological predisposition uh, or whether that is a function of environment. So women tend to make less money. Uh, they often have lower socioeconomic status. Uh, they also have obviously different hormones uh, in terms of the relative ratios uh, than men do. Uh, so, and of course, men are less likely to uh, seek out psychological services, seek out help. Uh, and so when we talk about differences in diagnosis rates for depression between men and women, uh, we have to keep that in mind. That is diagnosis rates. There are a number of things uh, other than the actual incidence of depression that can influence those diagnosis rates. Uh, and in terms of heritability, going back to those biological components of mental disorders, uh, severe depression uh, is highly heritable. That, so it seems to have a large genetic component. Uh, more moderate or mild forms of depression seem to be less dependent on genetics. They are more environmental. Uh, and so it's hard to, to say how heritable depression is overall uh, because it depends on how severe the depression is that we're talking about. Uh, looking at the brain, uh, so we know, for example, that part of prefrontal cortex seems to be important when it comes to depression. Uh, so this in the lower right is a figure from another book. Uh, and this is an area that's active uh, when the person is asked to recall a sad experience. Uh, and so this, this part of the prefrontal cortex that's right next to the corpus callosum uh, is active uh, during sad thought. Uh, now what's interesting uh, is that there are neurotransmitters involved as well. So serotonin is the most notable. Most antidepressants, that is drugs that treat depression, uh, depend on serotonin levels. So if you increase serotonin levels, uh, it tends to alleviate the symptoms of depression. Now, that doesn't work for everyone. There is no one-size-fits-all solution. Uh, and also, norepinephrine seems to have a role as well. So if you elevate levels of norepinephrine, uh, that can also alleviate the symptoms of depression. And, and we're not sure why that is. So some drugs will work just on serotonin. Some drugs will work uh, on both serotonin and norepinephrine. And some will work more on norepinephrine. So it varies from person to person. And again, we're still figuring out why that is, why these two different neurotransmitters can both have an effect on depression symptoms. Uh, there are genetic influences, to be sure, especially when it comes to more severe forms of depression. Uh, so there, there is a protein uh, that is responsible for uh, removing serotonin from the synaptic cleft. It pulls serotonin back into the presynaptic neuron. Uh, and, of course, that protein has to be encoded by genes. That's what that's where proteins come from. Uh, they are produced by genes. Uh, and when it comes to that protein, people will have different forms of that gene. Uh, and some forms of that gene are better at pulling serotonin back in than others. 
Uh, and, and so depending on which form of that gene you have, or if you have a mixture of the two forms, everyone has two copies of a given gene, uh, you are more likely to be at risk for depression if you have what is called the short allele. Uh, allele is just a word meaning the version of the gene that you have. So if you have two versions, two short versions of the allele, uh, you are at a higher risk for depression. Um, if you have the longer versions, you are at less risk. And when it comes to this particular gene, uh, you actually have less cortex uh, in this same area of prefrontal cortex um, when you have two versions, two short versions of that allele, uh, of that gene. So not only does this, these genes affect the proteins at a very small scale, uh, it affects the size of cortex at a very large scale. Uh, and so we see this same area in the brain come up again. Same area that becomes active when people think of something sad uh, is also thinner with regard to gray matter uh, when they have the two short versions of the gene and therefore at higher risk for depression. Uh, and it's thought that prefrontal cortex in this area in particular uh, are important for regulating emotion. So it's not the case that this area produces emotions necessarily, uh, but that the prefrontal cortex is important for reining in emotional responses, for inhibiting emotions. And so if you have less prefrontal cortex for whatever reason, uh, you often have less control over your emotional state. And so the idea here is that people with these short versions of the gene uh, may have less prefrontal cortex and therefore may have less control over their emotional state and be more at risk for depression. Uh, of course, there are other mood disorders as well. It's not limited to depression. Uh, there is, for example, seasonal affective disorder. Uh, and this uh, has symptoms of depression, uh, but they are linked to the changing of the seasons. Uh, in particular, they seem to be affected by the amount of light available, so day-night cycles. Uh, as the days get shorter, people tend to, with this disorder tend to come at higher risk uh, for those depressive symptoms. Uh, and people at higher latitudes uh, are also at higher risk than those that are closer to the equator. So that's an, obviously another environmental impact on the expression of mental disorders. Uh, there's also bipolar disorder, uh, which used to be known as manic depression, uh, though that term is not really in use anymore. But you can see the two components of that old term, mania and depression, and these are often described as, as high mood and low mood. Uh, so the low mood is the depression component. Uh, and, and so there you have symptoms of classical unipolar depression. Uh, the high mood uh, is mania. Uh, and so that is where the person often has high energy. Uh, they often have uh, reckless behaviors like gambling or hypersexuality. Uh, they often have delusions of grandeur. They think they have superpowers in one way or another. Uh, they can often exhibit uh, periods of creativity. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but the idea is that the person goes back and forth uh, between mania and depression. There will be periods where they exhibit neither, uh, but mania and depression are often tied together uh, and, and when it comes to bipolar disorder. Uh, and the frequency with which this happens can vary greatly from person to person. You can have rapid cycling uh, bipolar disorder, uh, which, as the name suggests, means you go through these cycles much more quickly. Uh, bipolar disorder seems to be highly heritable, uh, so it tends to run in families. As the, it seems to have a genetic component. Uh, and, of course, uh, anecdotally, it has been suggested that uh, those with bipolar disorder uh, have higher creative abilities. Uh, and so individuals like Isaac Newton and Vincent van Gogh uh, and Winston Churchill have all been attributed with bipolar disorder. Uh, now, Winston Churchill's writings certainly indicate uh, possible depression. Um, and it is, again, up, up for debate whether all these individuals or any of them had bipolar disorder. Uh, it's especially difficult to verify the further back in history you go. So there you're depending on personal writings, you're depending on uh, accounts of acquaintances and friends and family. Uh, so it can be very hard uh, to assess 
whether someone has the, the symptoms of bipolar disorder. So we have to be, we have to be careful uh, trying to assign mental disorders to certain individuals uh, when they haven't been diagnosed by a professional. Uh, and, and so that's something we, we have to be wary of, uh, especially when it comes to things like saying that people that have a disorder have some other attribute as well, like this. Uh, switching gears a bit, well, I'll not talk about schizophrenia. Uh, and schizophrenia is a, a very common mental disorder. Uh, it occurs in about 1% of the population. Uh, that may not sound all that common, but if you think about the severity of schizophrenia uh, and how impairing its symptoms can be, uh, it, it is an important mental disorder to consider. Uh, and, and there are a couple different groups of symptoms when it comes to schizophrenia. Uh, one of them are called positive symptoms. Uh, now, this is not to say that the symptoms are helpful or beneficial or pleasant. Uh, that is not what positive means in this context. Uh, what positive symptoms are uh, are those characteristics uh, that other people don't have. Uh, they've been added in schizophrenia. So that's the sense in which they're positive. They've been added to the individual. Uh, and so those without schizophrenia do not have these symptoms. And these are things like hallucinations, uh, which are the perception uh, of stimuli that aren't actually there. And most commonly, this is in the form of auditory hallucinations. Uh, people with schizophrenia uh, often report hearing voices, uh, voices that tell them what to do or criticize them. Uh, and so that is the most common form of hallucination. There are also delusions, uh, which is the belief in something when it's not true, uh, especially the belief uh, in spite of contradictory evidence. So we've probably all, at one point or another, uh, believed something that turned out not to be true later. Uh, but the, the criterion here is whether the belief is plausible uh, given the information you have. Uh, and the most common form of this in schizophrenia uh, is the paranoid delusion, the belief that someone uh, is, out, is out to harm you uh, or out to uh, impair your life in some way. So that is the most common form of delusion. Uh, and again, it the, the, the critical criterion here is that it doesn't stand up to scrutiny. Uh, so these are often very intricate delusions, uh, especially when it comes to uh, supernatural beings or governments uh, being out to harm or interfere with the life of the sufferer. Uh, you also have things like disorganized speech. And again, this is something that the average individual doesn't have, but someone with schizophrenia does. Uh, and so what does disorganized speech mean? Uh, it means that uh, the person can go off on tangents very easily. Uh, they'll exhibit what's called loose association thinking. So they'll start saying a sentence, uh, and then they'll focus on one topic, and then suddenly they'll switch topics uh, based on words in the sentence or based on a word that rhymes with something they've said. Uh, and so they'll kind of switch from topic to topic uh, very rapidly, and so their, their speech can be hard to follow and hard to understand. So that's what's meant by disorganized speech. Uh, you also have negative symptoms, uh, which are things that the average person has, uh, but that are lost uh, in schizophrenia. And so these are deficits or the loss of some aspect of psychological function. Uh, one of the most common is flat affect, uh, and that is where the person with schizophrenia uh, doesn't really express emotions. Uh, they often report not feeling them as strongly either. Uh, and so the person seems kind of flat. That's why it's called flat affect. Their emotional expression, their affect, uh, is flattened, it's diminished. Uh, and so that blunted emotional response uh, is part of schizophrenia. Uh, poverty of speech, uh, which means this, their, the person with schizophrenia tends to be less talkative than a person who doesn't have the disorder. Uh, you also have anhedonia, uh, which I mentioned previously. Uh, anhedonia is the loss of pleasure. So it's often associated with depression, but it can also occur in schizophrenia. Uh, and so the loss of pleasurable feeling uh, is a common symptom. Uh, you also have cognitive symptoms, and your book doesn't go into much detail here. I'll go into 
a little more detailed. Uh, but individuals with schizophrenia uh, often suffer deficits in working memory, the ability to hold information in mind. Uh, one of the most common examples of this is uh, when we try to remember a phone number. We can hold those numbers in mind, even if it's 10 digits long. Uh, and individuals with schizophrenia have trouble holding that much information in mind for even a short while. Uh, and so they have deficits in working memory. They also have deficits in attention, staying focused on something. Uh, so that's another cognitive symptom. Uh, individuals with schizophrenia also have trouble inhibiting actions. Uh, if they're used to performing a certain action, they will often do it automatically or habitually, uh, even when they shouldn't. Uh, and experimentally, uh, this is often done with what's called a go, no-go task. Uh, and the way this works is a, a person, whether a patient or a control person, uh, is presented with a series of letters. Uh, and they're supposed to press a button every time a letter comes up. And people, this is a pretty easy task, people are pretty good at it. Uh, but they're also told not to press the button when a particular letter comes up. And this diagram here is the letter X. They're supposed to go, that is, press the button, most of the time. Uh, but under certain circumstances, they're supposed to inhibit their action. They're supposed to not do anything. Uh, and individuals with schizophrenia have trouble with that no-go part. They, have, they don't have trouble pressing the button after a letter comes up. Uh, but if they're supposed to stop themselves, they don't do so well, or they don't do as well as control individuals. Uh, and so inhibition of action seems to be uh, a trouble spot for individuals with schizophrenia. Uh, so when it comes to schizophrenia, schizophrenia is a very complex illness. We just went over the symptoms. Uh, and we have identified certain risk factors. We do not know the underlying cause of schizophrenia, uh, but we know certain environmental or genetic factors uh, that increase the risk. So there, there's about a 50% concordance, as it's called, uh, between identical twins. What does that mean? Uh, well, it means that if a person has schizophrenia, uh, if that person has an identical twin, uh, then that twin has about a 50% chance of also developing a schizophrenia. So that means that there's a, a large genetic component because identical twins are genetically identical. Uh, the risk goes down for fraternal twins or other siblings, uh, but there is still an increased risk. Uh, and the, same, the story is the same for parents, uh, for children, that sort of thing. So, so it does tend to run in families in that sense. Uh, but it, of course, also means that there's a 50% non-genetic component. So the environment has a role to play there as well. Uh, one factor we know is important is the influence of an urban environment. So a person that lives in the country has a certain risk of developing schizophrenia. And that's shown here in the diagram at the bottom right. This is not from your book. Uh, however, if you compare the risk of developing schizophrenia uh, between individuals in the country and individuals that live in a small city, those that live in the small city are at higher risk, about 50% higher. It depends somewhat on when the person moves to the city. So if they move as a child, their risk is higher. They've been in the city longer. Uh, and if they move to a big city, their risk is even higher, it's almost twice the, other, other, the normal risk for schizophrenia that exists in the country. Uh, and so again, it depends on the age at which one moves. Uh, but an urban environment does seem to be a factor. Uh, we don't know exactly why that is. It could be uh, effects of social isolation, which occurs uh, in large cities with lots of people. It could be environmental factors, pollutants that exist more in the city than in the country. Uh, we don't really know. Uh, but we do know that that urban environment is associated with a higher risk. A uh, birth month uh, also uh, associated with risk of schizophrenia. If you were born in the winter or the spring, at least in the northern hemisphere, uh, you tend to be at a higher risk for developing schizophrenia. And we, and we think uh, that's because of seasonal illnesses, uh, things like the flu. Uh, so if depending on what gestational stage you're at, uh, 
when you were developing prenatally, uh, if the mother contracts the flu and other diseases as well, um, then that elevates the risk for the fetus, but it depends on what developmental stage the fetus is at. Uh, stress in general also increases the risk of developing schizophrenia. So living in an abusive environment, for example, uh, other forms of abuse that one might suffer in childhood are correlated with schizophrenia. So we go back to that diathesis stress model, uh, the idea that someone might have genetic risk factors for schizophrenia, uh, but if they're not in a stressful environment, they don't end up developing it. Whereas someone with those exact same risk factors, if they are subjected to chronic stress, will develop schizophrenia. So there's an interaction between genetics and environmental stress. Uh, when it comes to the brain, there are measurable changes in the brain uh, with the onset of schizophrenia. Uh, one of the most noticeable is the enlargement of ventricles. So ventricles are the fluid-filled cavities inside the brain. Uh, your book has one diagram. I don't think it's a very good diagram, so I'm using one from a different book. But the point is the same. Uh, here in the lower left, on the left side, uh, we see one person who doesn't have schizophrenia, and we see the size of those ventricles in the middle of the brain. Uh, on the right, uh, is their identical twin? And their identical twin does have schizophrenia, and we can see a difference in the size of the ventricles, the size of those cavities. They're much larger. And that seems to be a result of neuronal shrinkage. So the volume of neurons seems to decrease in schizophrenia. On a related note, uh, you also have the loss of frontal cortex. So this diagram is from your book. Uh, and what you see here uh, is that a little bit of neuronal loss is normal during adolescent development, uh, but a, a large amount of loss is not. Uh, and so those with schizophrenia tend to lose a large number of neurons in the prefrontal cortex. Uh, and so that's another symptom of schizophrenia. Now, we don't know whether this is causative or whether this is an effect. It could be possible that loss of prefrontal cortex neurons leads to schizophrenia. It could also be that development of schizophrenia has other symptoms, and one of them is the loss of prefrontal cortex. We don't know. Uh, one common hypothesis of schizophrenia uh, is the involvement of dopamine, the idea that schizophrenia is associated with high levels of dopamine. Uh, schizophrenia traditionally has been treated with drugs that reduce dopamine levels, uh, and those tend to decrease uh, the severity of symptoms, in particular positive symptoms. So people, if they, if they go on anti-dopaminergic medication, uh, stop experiencing auditory hallucinations. Their delusions get less severe. It doesn't do as much for their negative symptoms, uh, but it does seem to alleviate, on average, uh, those positive symptoms. Uh, however, there may also be a role for glutamate. Uh, so certain drugs, things like PCP, uh, if taken in sufficient dosage, can mimic the symptoms of schizophrenia. Now, PCP doesn't affect dopamine. It affects glutamate. Uh, and so the story is unfortunately even more complex than we originally thought. Dopamine is probably involved, uh, but glutamate may be involved also. We just, we just aren't sure yet. So research is ongoing. Uh, now, another category of disorder uh, is the neurodevelopmental disorders. Now, by definition, these occur developmentally. That is, they start during childhood. Uh, one of the most famous uh, is autism spectrum disorder, which includes autism itself. Uh, and, and these are disorders uh, characterized by deficits in communication. So individuals have trouble communicating, expressing themselves. Uh, they also tend to engage in repetitive behaviors. Uh, one of the most common, especially during early childhood, is what's known as flapping, uh, where the child will, will flap his or her arms uh, repeatedly. Uh, other repetitive behaviors include uh, fascination with a certain object, uh, or it could be a toy or a piece of furniture, uh, repetitive behaviors, obsession with hobbies, uh, certain activities. Uh, and, and, and so that is one of the symptoms of autism spectrum disorder. Uh, individuals with ASD often have trouble with theory of mind. And this is a topic we've covered before. Uh, Theory of mind is the ability 
to understand other people uh, with regard to their beliefs, their goals, uh, what they want, uh, and so the idea that not everyone knows what we know, not everyone wants what we want. Uh, so you can model them separately and understand a little more about them, trying to anticipate their actions. Uh, so as the individuals uh, have some trouble with theory of mind, but they also uh, may have enhanced abilities when it comes to object perception. Uh, so the ability to categorize objects, uh, to recognize patterns, these seem to be enhanced in many individuals with ASD. Uh, what's interesting about ASD is that diagnosis, diagnosis rates uh, have been on the increase quite dramatically. So around 40 years ago, uh, only one in every few thousand individuals was diagnosed with autism. More recently, uh, it's around 1%, so 1 in 100. So that's a huge increase. And the question is, what is responsible for that increase? Is it actually uh, that more people have autism? Uh, or is it more that people are being recognized as having it? That our diagnosis rate has changed, uh, but that the underlying rate of autism itself is not. Um, so there seems to be some of both. Uh, so certainly, uh, diagnostic criteria and understanding of ASD has shifted over the decades. So many people that used to be diagnosed with intellectual disability uh, are now diagnosed as having ASD. Uh, there's also greater awareness. Uh, and with greater awareness comes a greater likelihood of being diagnosed. Uh, one environmental factor is parental age. Uh, in the last few decades, people have started having children later in life. Uh, before, people would have children in their late teens, 20s. Uh, now they're starting more commonly to have children in their 30s or even 40s. Uh, and so that increased parental age is correlated with increase uh, in ASD diagnosis. But there's still quite a bit we don't know. So down here in this bottom right figure, that pie chart indicates what accounts for this increase in diagnosis. That large section with the question mark is how much we don't know about that increase. And it's about half. So we can account for about half the increase, but we can't account yet uh, for the other half. So we're still trying to figure out what's causing that increase in diagnosis. Uh, another group of disorders are, are the Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorders, ADHD. Uh, and so, as you can tell from the name, uh, these are associated with trouble with attention, uh, diminished attention capacity, and also hyperactivity, difficulties with impulse control. Uh, and all children experience or exhibit this from time to time. Impulsivity, difficulty focusing. Uh, it has to occur for a period of months in multiple locations to qualify for ADHD. Uh, and, uh, of course, one of, surprisingly, the most uh, effective medications for ADHD uh, are stimulants, which is a little counterintuitive. You would think that if someone has trouble controlling impulses and paying attention, that the last thing you would want to give is a stimulant that increases neural excitability, and yet they seem to work quite well. Uh, there's a high degree of heritability for ADHD. Uh, it is often thought that only children have ADHD, but that is not true. Adults have it too. Uh, and there's a high degree of heritability, a big genetic component, we think, uh, for inheriting ADHD. Uh, and finally, we come to conduct disorder, and this is a tough one. Uh, so it's characterized by childhood behaviors like aggressive behavior, bullying, uh, deceitfulness, lying, uh, Stealing, not obeying social rules, running away. Uh, and, and so there's a collection of symptoms. In fact, there are up to 15 symptoms uh, that a person can exhibit, but they only have to exhibit three of them to qualify for conduct disorder. And that's what makes this uh, sort of a more difficult mental disorder, uh, is that you can have five children, all diagnosed with conduct disorder, who exhibit no overlapping symptoms whatsoever because there are so many possible symptoms, but you only need to exhibit three of them to qualify. Uh, and so this is one of those kinds of disorders uh, that diagnosing can be very tough uh, because you have so many possible symptoms.
uh, and because they are so different in many cases. Okay, now I'll move on to personality disorders. So, of course, the question is, how do we define a personality disorder? What is a personality disorder? Uh, so, it describes a pattern of feeling, thinking, and behaving, which is part of our definition of personality in the first place. So, it's, it's a pattern uh, that deviates from cultural expectations. So, again, we come to the role of culture, uh, that certain behaviors, uh, certain ways of responding to a situation, uh, may be unusual in one culture, but not in another. Uh, and so in considering personality disorders, we have to consider what's normal, so to speak, within a given culture. Uh, but these are personality characteristics or traits uh, that deviate from the norm and end up impairing function in some way. They cause behaviors uh, that are harmful to the individual or harmful to others or make it difficult to operate in society. Uh, and so that's a, that's a bit vague, and that's an important thing to note. Uh, many people question the usefulness uh, of categories for personality disorder. Uh, many people think that people just exist on a spectrum. Uh, and rather than put people on the ends of that spectrum in a separate category, maybe we should just try to understand the extreme versions of those personality traits. Now, that's not a universal opinion. Uh, and, and I'll talk about only two personality disorders today. There are many, uh, but I'll cover two as examples uh, of differences in personality and how they impair function. Uh, one of them is called antisocial personality disorder. So from the name, it sounds like someone socially withdrawn. Uh, what actually is occurring here uh, is uh, aggressive tendency, hostile tendency. Uh, a lack of remorse, a lack of regard uh, for other individuals and their welfare. So people that, that don't care about the consequences of their behavior on others. Uh, and uh, this, this personality disorder uh, has a much higher incidence uh, among those that have been previously diagnosed with conduct disorder as children. Uh, so we can see a parallel there between behaviors in childhood and in adulthood. Uh, both disorders are associated with aggression. Uh, both behaviors are often associated with deceitfulness. Uh, so people with antisocial personality disorder uh, will be, can be fairly adept at lying and deceiving others, and they don't have any trouble with it. It does not bother them. Uh, it's highly prevalent uh, among the prison population. So around half of male prisoners, it is thought, uh, have diagnosable criteria for antisocial personality disorder. This picture in the top right is from uh, a famous serial killer. Uh, and, and so the term psychopath or sociopath uh, is often associated with antisocial personality disorder. These are people that can, on the surface, be very charming, uh, but will have aggressive, harmful tendencies uh, will engage in uh, unethical actions like lying uh, in order to get what they want. Uh, and so it's highly prevalent among those that have committed crimes, especially violent crimes. Uh, looking at the brain, uh, so there's a famous study that looked at the brains of individuals with antisocial personality disorder. Uh, and when viewing negative words like hate, murder, uh, the individuals with antisocial personality disorder uh, exhibited less amygdala activity than control individuals. So they seem to be less emotionally responsive to those emotionally laden concepts. So we see a decrease in amygdala activity uh, in antisocial personality disorder. So the question of whether these are real personality disorders or whether they just exist on a spectrum, um, whatever the case, we can see differences in the brain uh, for people that exhibit these behaviors and have these tendencies. Uh, another personality disorder uh, is called borderline personality disorder. And I've mentioned this one before. So this is uh, characterized by uh, an, a, a difficulty maintaining social relationships, uh, especially when it comes to trust. Uh, people with BPD have trouble trusting other individuals. 
They are afraid they will be abandoned. Uh, they also are very emotionally reactive. Uh, they tend to view people uh, as either entirely good or entirely bad and out to get them. Uh, and so BPD is characterized by emotional instability. Uh, also impulsive behaviors, reckless behaviors. Uh, and these can include things like substance use, but also sexual behavior. Uh, and so these people have trouble uh, with relationships, with maintaining relationships, especially long-term ones. They have difficulty with family members. Uh, they have difficulty with romantic relationships uh, because of difficulty trusting other individuals. Uh, and so obviously this, this results in an impairment uh, in social function, difficult to function socially with this disorder. Uh, what's also interesting, and I mentioned this before, you actually see increased amygdala activity in these individuals. So that they're viewing emotional expressions, even if those expressions have no emotional content. They could be neutral expressions. Uh, and yet, you will see increased amygdala activity uh, in individuals that have BPD. So again, those are just two personality disorders. There are many, uh, but those are two examples. Uh, and they also show that we know something about the relationship between these disorders and the brain. Uh, finally, we come to self-harm behaviors. Now, the most obvious self-harm behavior is suicide. Uh, that is, the intentional ending of one's own life. Uh, and this is surprisingly common. Uh, so about 15% of the U.S. population has considered suicide at one point or another. 5% uh, have attempted it. And, and a couple percent have succeeded. If I, there, there is a suicide rate uh, such that it is a common cause of death in the U.S. Uh, it is often comorbid with mental disorders. So uh, I previously mentioned the concept of comorbidity. This is when disorders or symptoms occur together. Uh, so the suicide rate among those with mental disorders is very high, uh, especially the more mental disorders one has. Uh, so it is, it is common to have more than one, uh, and the more one has, uh, the more common suicide attempts are. Uh, there is a developmental pattern for suicide. So it is very uncommon, it's almost unheard of, uh, for children before the age of 10 uh, to consider suicide, much less to attempt it. Uh, but it becomes much more common during adolescence, and then it kind of levels off. Uh, so, adolescence is a period associated with, with large develop developmental changes uh, and stress, especially social stress. Uh, and, and so, suicidal thinking or suicidal behaviors uh, become increasingly common during adolescence. Uh, now, there are differences when it comes to sex and ethnicity. So, it is more common for women to attempt suicide. Uh, but it is more common for men uh, to actually commit suicide, to successfully end their own lives. Uh, and so we see a difference in attempts versus uh, successful suicide behavior. Uh, and, and so that is uh, partially a difference in, in preferred method. Uh, but there are also ethnic differences. Uh, so we have differences between the sexes. We also have differences in ethnicity. So white individuals uh, account for the vast majority uh, of suicides. Uh, and so we don't know exactly why that is, uh, but there are sex and ethnic, ethnic differences to be found in suicide rates. Uh, and now that's different from non-suicidal self-injury. So it is surprisingly common, 15 to 20% of adults, 36% of, uh, of teens, uh, for individuals to hurt themselves in one way or another, but not with the intention of killing themselves. That's why it's non-suicidal. This is also different from suicide attempts. Um, so obviously suicide attempts uh, involve self-harm, but they were done with the intention of suicide. These, these non-suicidal self-injuries uh, are not done with the intention of ending one's own life. But they are surprisingly common. Uh, and most, most commonly, we think, uh, these occur as a response to negative events in one's life. 
So if someone finds the emotional response or the physiological response to an event uh, intolerable, they will often try to mitigate that emotional experience through self-harm, that they prefer the experience of self-harm to the emotional experience they would otherwise otherwise have. Uh, and so it's thought to be a response to these negative, possibly traumatic events. Uh, it's also thought they may be a means of communicating distress. Uh, so again, not suicide attempts, but non-suicidal self-injuries uh, can possibly be associated with that communication attempt. So it's a behavior uh, that's intended to signal the person needs help. We also have to consider culture here. So there are cultures uh, in which there are non-suicidal self-injuries, uh, but they are part of the cultural tradition. And so they don't count uh, as these, these non-suicidal self-injuries in the classical sense. Uh, so things like ritual scarring uh, are common in certain cultures. Uh, and yet they do not count as this sort of behavior because they are part of the culture. So this is another context uh, in which we have to consider what's quote-unquote normal uh, for someone in that culture. Okay, that will do it for our coverage uh, of psychological disorders. Uh, next time, we'll start looking at the treatment of psychological disorders. So this can be, very, uh, be a very difficult issue. Uh, success rates are not 100% when it comes to treatment. So it can be a hard process. Uh, we'll talk about different forms of treatment. One of those is psychotherapy, uh, in which a person communicates with a therapist. Uh, there are also medication-based approaches and even surgically-based approaches to psychological disorders. And for all of these things, we'll come back to how effective they are. So do they succeed in treating and curing uh, psychological disorders? Do they succeed uh, in mitigating or getting rid of the symptoms? Uh, so we'll talk about that next time, and I will see you then.